Good morning. We'll get started. Thank you all for being here. If we rise for our invocation and pledge of allegiance. You can bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for this time that we have together to do uh, your work by serving our community in Pinellas County, the students, the workforce, uh, raising our individual community members up through education and employment. This year, it's sometimes difficult to remember how many things we have to be thankful for. But on this eve of Thanksgiving week, we do express our gratitude for each and every employee, staff person, faculty member, student who is here at the college, the board of trustees and the other leaders who guide the way and each of our uh, donors and our foundation and everyone who allows for us to continue this work. Please bless the decisions that we have today and guide us to make thoughtful and courageous decisions on a daily basis. In your name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, it's nice to see those of us, I know it's not a full house, but it, it, are, uh, it is nice to see um, those of you who are here with us today. So with that, I think Janet. Good morning, Madam Chair Cole, trustees, and Dr. Williams. This morning, I'm very excited to announce Dr. Hector Laura. He is coming from, uh, to us from Martin Methodist College in Tennessee. He served as an assistant vice president there for their finance department. He has extensive, um, about 10 years of experience in budgeting, finance, purchasing, accounts payable, contracts, et cetera, and also in business metrics and long-term planning. And so this morning, I really like to introduce you to Dr. Hector Laura. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank the Lord for giving me the opportunity to be here today. And the second thing, I want to thank the search committee for giving me the opportunity to join the St. Petersburg College community. And I look forward to continue building up on the foundation that Dr. Williams, Ms. Hunt, her team, the board, and the administrator have built, have built already. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And are you yeah. introducing yeah. Dr. Williams? Yeah. I have the uh, pleasure as well to bring forward Larry. Oh, my mic isn't on, sorry. Um, Larry Llewellyn, is he here? He is. Yes. yes. Larry has joined us to help us in HR. He comes from the registry and has 29 years at Ohio State, 14 years as vice president um, and chief HR officer. Um, for the entire um, university and medical center. He has been around with PeopleSoft, employee relations, um, and everything that we need here at the college. Everyone has already said how pleased they are to work with Larry. Would you like to come up and say a few words? Thank you so much and welcome aboard. Thank you very much and I appreciate you inviting me here for this assignment because I it is very timely to put the Office of HR on a different path to yes. elevate it and move it forward because I, I see it as a very important building block for your strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And so my job is to, is to do that and then at some point we'll start a search for a, a real CHRO, a real head of HR because I'm an interim consultant. And we won't start that for a little while. The schedule will be at the pleasure of the president, but it's never too early to start cultivating candidates. So if you know somebody, you might want to point my way, I would appreciate it. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Very good. So um, with our comments, um, I would just like to share, I know, I think we've talked about this briefly, but um, just to bring the board up to date, um, the there's been an ad hoc uh, real estate committee that was formed with volunteers from the community and we've had two meetings, one of which was a, just more organizational, giving some background about the real estate uh, ownership and what the board's direction has been to the team 
over the past few years about reducing our footprint, maximizing the use of space, um, acknowledging that especially this year with the evolution of an even greater participation online. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, I think, we uh, joined together for a bus tour similar to what the Board of Trustees uh, did a few years ago with this small group and we came to Allstate and we went um, to Midtown mm -hmm. and we looked at those facilities, the gymnasium at Midtown, and uh, we have our next meeting scheduled for next week. And so our uh, Don Mastery is the chair of the committee. And so Don and I spoke and it's our goal that if not after the next meeting, but hopefully right after the first of the year, um, this ad hoc committee can make some recommendations to the board about timing of disposition of property, if that's what the board desires as well as the best opportunity. Uh, while the staff did an amazing job putting together the uh, analysis of all of the property that we've had a uh, few years ago, then when that's when the board started the direction of disposing of district office, um, Dr. Williams and I were talking and we felt like, especially with the real estate market as it is and some of the, uh, the transition to online classes, we needed to look even more specifically at our real estate holdings. So I uh, just, I know you all had heard bits and pieces from Dr. Mm -hmm. Williams and about that, but I just wanted to share that. And if you all had any questions now, happy to answer them. But otherwise, I think probably in February timeframe, right, I yeah, guess yeah. we would have a report back from that real estate. <coughs> so yeah. so with, with that, I don't really have any other comments. So, uh, Mr. Stone, if I can. Not for me today. All right. Ms. Bello? Um, I guess the only thing that maybe people don't know is we had a naming committee for um, Leslie Honig. At, at the, I'm going to say it wrong, so Dr. Williams, you can say the official name, but at the Health Center. <laughs> um, and it passed unanimously, so that was a, um, that was a neat thing to be a part yes. of. Very good. Cool. Thank you. Mr. Kidwell? Uh, we had our... <clears throat> quarterly Leaper Ratner Museum uh, board meeting two weeks ago. Uh, I'd just like to say publicly that uh, Dr. Wilkins and the board do a fantastic job. That's great. Um, very impressive to be a part of that. And uh, about a week later, I took my kids up there for the first time, and uh, they understood the art way more than I did. So <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, and and just like everybody else. You know, they're struggling, but they're doing a great job trying to, uh, they did an online auction for the past two weeks to try to raise some money. They're being pretty innovative, but like everybody else during COVID, it's, it's been pretty rough. Excellent. Thank you. Is the auction still going on? No. Uh, I think it ended maybe in the last week. Okay. But there you go. Thanks. Mr. Gibbons, we're just under board comments. If you oh, go ahead. have good. any comments you'd like to share? We no, ma'am, I'm good. All righty. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Williams? Yes, I only have um, one comment. I want to recognize Katie Schultz and uh, Mike Ramsey and team for the work that they did with St. Pete Works. We received a $2.8 million grant from the city of St. Petersburg to help individuals in poverty um, get jobs. Um, get families um, on the right track. The grant is for three years. Um, and so um, kudos to them. <laughs> and that's my report. Great, thank you. I don't have any public comment cards, but is there anyone here that would like to participate in public comment? Seeing none, we will move forward. Uh, with the review and approval of minutes that were distributed to the trustees previously, any comments or amendments to those minutes? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? I'll move to approve the minutes. All, any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Moving on to our monthly reports, Ms. Gardner. Yes, uh, good morning, Chair Cole, trustees, Dr. Williams. Good morning. Um, I would like to just update you on the contract for the adjunct faculty union. So as you know, we've been in collective bargaining since March. We started off with an in-person meeting in um, 
since uh, since our first meeting. We've been meeting virtually. Uh, so thank you to um, the the union team, uh, their negotiator Rick, Rick Smith, and also our own uh, team, um, as well as the collaborative labs that kind of facilitated a lot of our discussions. So we've finished collective bargaining sessions, but we are just uh, now looking to have a finalized agreement in the next week or so. So we would like to get that to you with um, a memo and some recommendations uh, to move forward with the next steps of the board um, in looking at the, the contract, uh, the consensus, and uh, the union will be moving forward with rat ratification on their end and then the board moving forward with final approval. So we'll get that information out when we get just the last pieces of it together in the, in the next week. Thank you. Any questions about that? What's th what's the uh, standard timeline for that next phase, typically, Ms. Gardner? I would say um, we understand from the union that um, once we get a finalized version, that it will take them three to four weeks to ratify. They have to be ratif the the contract itself needs to be ratified by their union members, um, and then it will come back uh, to us for final approval in an open board meeting. So. It, should be done in the next two months. Does the board have an opportunity to comment prior to it being distributed to the union for ratification, or we will only see the final? We can get you the final version, um, I think, within the next couple of days, and the board is certainly welcome to uh, provide comment, uh, to review, to review the recommendations um, of, the, of the team, Dr. Williams. Um, and if, uh, if necessary, we can, we can have a, a meeting uh, to review the provisions. Um, so I, I think at, at, this, at this point, I, I, I think I would like to maybe have you take a look at the recommendations um, and the, the version that's been finalized. And then if there's any questions, we can certainly make a decision as to uh, whether our next steps would include a meeting of the board to, to okay. review. One thing I think would be helpful to me when we receive the memo and the recommendations would be to include, which I'm sure you probably would, a comparison of this current status versus what's proposed and what is actually changing based upon the current status. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Briggs with the FGO. Welcome, nice to see you. Well, it's nice to see you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, trustees, Dr. Williams. I'm here this morning to give you an update on FGO. To be respectful for your time, I'll keep this brief. But before I started, I wanted to thank you for inviting me to be here. It gave me a chance to see people in person <laughs> and to leave my house, so, which is a treat. Okay. <clears throat> the executive team and senators represent approximately 340 full-time faculty. This slide shows the FGO leadership for academic year 2020 to 2021. This update can be summed up in three words, constitution, communication, and coronavirus. There we go. We've completed the process of revising the FGO constitution and faculty have approved the revision. Once we've completed discussions with Dr. Williams and Dr. Leo Troff and it receives their approval, the document will be presented to you at a future Board of Trustees meeting. Like the rest of the college, FGO has gotten on the Zoom train and continued our meetings. Normally, FGO meets only in the fall and spring. This year, we made the decision to have faculty meet monthly throughout the summer. This was done to discuss the rapid changes that were occurring at the college. Both Drs. Williams and Leo Troff have attended Senate meetings and campus FGO meetings. In addition, we will work with Dr. Leo Troff 
standardized contract language on full-time faculties continuing contracts. And Senate continues to meet with Dean's Council twice yearly. Finally, our hardworking faculty worked even harder this year. We spent countless hours in an effort to turn our course delivery on a dime from face-to-face -to, -face to live online modality. There are literally hundreds of stories of faculty going above and beyond to make sure we never missed a beat and that our students were given every opportunity to succeed in this difficult time. The faculty have weathered the COVID storm in an effort to reinforce the pillar of academic excellence here at St. Petersburg College. I'd like to say I'm humbled and honored to both represent the faculty as president of FGO, as well as address this board today. I thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Bray. Any questions? <coughs> No, we appreciate the update. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for letting me leave my house. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Wonderful. Is Madeline here? She's joining us here. Thank you. I, thought, I presumed that, but I didn't see technology changing, so I was... <laughs> Good morning. Can you, make, can you hear us? No. There we go. Can you hear us now? Yes, now I can hear you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. We appreciate you joining us this morning and um, for an update on strategic plan. I've been getting the benefit of uh, regular updates from Dr. Williams, and so we're thrilled to continue uh, listening from your standpoint, what's been happening, and giving us that update. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good morning, Madam Chair, rest of the board, President Williams. Um, it has been really just great. We've hit the ground running in regards to just um, starting to lay out the foundation for um, I want to start with, you know, the first slide is what we did um, in August when we looked at all of our internal analysis. In September, we did the board survey. We heard from you. You set out the vision and expectations. In October, we engaged um, really the SPC family along faculty, staff, administrators, and we had town halls where we had an opportunity to look at what were barriers and what were strengths and what could we consider in terms of developing strategies. And so we really engaged um, the college during the month of October. In November, the um, strategic plan, something that Dr. Crawford has done is bring together the leaders that were leading some of these, the current strategic plan and starting to realign that that committee and developing high impact strategies. This Friday, we will meet again to identify key performance metrics and then develop an executive dashboard for the strategic, you know, for the E team of the institution, similar to the uh, dashboard that we set up for you as the board that we reviewed uh, back in September. So we are on track uh, to bring to you in December um, a final recommendation for the college's um, strategic plan, and then look at the execution as well as realigning strategic planning committee so that we can identify gold champions. And the um, next slide, as you reaffirmed, the mission and the vision will still, you know, as, as important today as it was when it was developed. The pillars that we're building from, from 2017, those were still incredibly strong pillars and certainly um, 
very much needed today when you think about the COVID environment, academic excellence, economic mobility, and community engagement based on two real foundational pillars on financial vitality and the employee experience. On the next slides, the next couple of slides, I'll just share with you at a high level what emerged out of each of the pillars in terms of themes that you um, should plan on seeing in terms of strategies in the prior, in our strategic plan. One is teaching and learning. The focus of teaching and learning is so critical. Student success. We heard from you about articulation and transfer, you know, success beyond SPC and academic program quality, making sure that we are um, refining and really re-looking at, at our academic programs for relevance and for alignment and for high quality. I think in a post-COVID environment, this is gonna be so critical um, to really align the teaching and learning with academic program quality because it's what's gonna attract students uh, to SPC, not only to um, start their career here, but also continue into the baccalaureate program pathways. In terms of the second pillar, which is the next slide, economic mobility, workforce and innovation. Um, the college is well positioned um, to be that leader, especially in the region in a post COVID recovery uh, by aligning workforce programs to business needs and by continuing to innovate uh, both in the teaching and learning aspect, but in the way that students are supported. The access and equity agenda, the, the, the pillars today are really seen through that lens of equity. And so access, um, remains incredibly important, how we reach out to the community that surrounds the college, how we continue to attract more students, and we build those strong industry partnerships so that students have an opportunity uh, to not only have internships, but other work-based learning opportunities. And then something we heard from you, are we ready for the student? We often say, is the student ready for us? But something that is emerging from the town halls and discussion groups we have is how do we fine tune and develop a high impact strategy to be ready for students and to be a student ready institution. And pillar three, community engagement. The economic and civic impact is so important. We heard that from you in the survey. We also heard it in our town halls with the faculty and staff and administrative teams. In this area, when we look at industry partnerships, we look at how can we develop win-win partnerships. In pillar two, we think about industry partnerships for students, internships, and work-based opportunities. Something that emerged not only from the survey here, but especially from the um, SPC team is, how could we build those community partnerships that are a win-win for both the community and for SPC? To be a thought leader convener, not only for the community, but for the state and across the nation to be seen as um, a leader in higher education, not only in terms of delivering higher education, but really being a thought leader and in influencing policy and practice throughout higher education. And then engaging students outside in the community. One of the, you know, the key metrics is the return on investment, the economic impact of our students out in the community, side by side, hand by hand with our faculty and with community leaders um, giving back that's a, almost a trifecta. The student engages in the community and that helps us bring um, class, you know, classroom learning into the community. It makes a difference in the community, but it also positions SPC as a leader in the community. In terms of um, the next slide, when we think about um, the strategic priorities around employee engagement, looking at an employee experience model instead of an a la carte, really looking at how employees are recruited, how they are onboarded and what type of professional development. Something that became clear, um, not only from your survey about making sure that there was alignment 
of the strategic plan from the board through the institution and up and down, um, really developing a high impact communication strategy within the college. The strategic priority alignment, when we think about re aligning the, um, strate the strategic planning committee, thinking about how then do departments and disciplines align to those same strategic priorities. And then really talent, talent retention and acquisition. And in a post COVID environment, everyone is gonna be searching for the right talent, having the right folks. And so there'll be a high impact strategy around that. And then the last one is um, financial vitality incredibly important, um, creating one of the things we, we heard also from faculty and staff, especially from the executive team and President Williams about developing entrepreneurial practices at the institution level. We talk about entrepreneurship at the student level, but how do we do that as an institution? Leveraging technology across and for student success, diversifying revenue sources, not only state um, and student tuition and fees, but federal grants and other type of partnerships and a data informed culture, making sure that we align data to strategy and that we're making those decisions from um, evidence and from data. I wanna share with you on the next slide, um, very quickly, I know you remember the, the dashboard that we shared with you in terms of what were those important indicators whether the college is on track when we think about enrollment and we think about student success. The next slide just reminds you of the survey results from the board and um, what you said you wanted to see in terms of the strategic plan. If you can go to the next slide. And again, you strongly agreed with the mission, um, the goals of the strategic plan to set the direction to identify strategic growth opportunities, fiscal resources, and recognizes SPC as a premier college in the country. And what would a successful plan have is clarity of direction, strong organization, and data-driven decision. And I'm happy to say that we are on a task to meet um, those successful components. And then the next slide, I just wanted um, to share with you here in terms of where you ranked foundational areas for success, academic excellence, workforce education, innovation, community partnership, and economic mobility. And we have certainly um, reaffirmed those areas with our um, town halls and the surveys that we've done and the meetings that we had with students as well. And then the next couple of slides, I'll just move through quickly, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of um, the format that we used in collaborative planning with faculty administrators and career staff. And you can go to the next slide. And you can see here academic. Are you there? Yeah. Perfect. And here you can see academic strategies, academic excellence strategies identified by the career staff. And it just gives you a little bit of an idea of the kind of rich and in-depth discussions um, that we did have. The next slide gives you a, a little bit of a brief opportunity to see economic mobility strategies that were being identified by staff and administrators regarding economic mobility. And this last slide, um, you from the faculty, community engagement strategies identified by um, the SPC faculty. And so I will just close um, by our final slide, which is really what we've laid out to do. Prioritize the vision of the board, align the strategic priorities to um, student success, to community engagement, to academic excellence. Look at how we invest our time and our talent and our treasure in accomplishing those, and then assess how we evaluate and developing those key performance metrics. And then aligning the supporting committees, fiscal and physical plan, human capital and technology of the college to advance the impact of the strategic plan and really advance the impact of the college. Madam Chair, that ends my uh, presentation. 
I know you guys wanted me to stay at 10 minutes and I think I just uh, came in at that time and I'll take any other questions or questions you may have or comments. Thank you so much. We so appreciate your efforts and the entire uh, college team, um, the outreach that you've done and the time that each of you all have spent um, working with Madeline to get this into a place where we can really um, have something, a good tangible document come December. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone? Very good. You got off easy. Good job. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, moving on, I think we have another Zoom um, meeting here update with our uh, lobbyist Capital City Consulting in Tallahassee on a very busy week for them. And so we appreciate them taking some time this morning. Um, so welcome. Uh, good, oh, good morning, morning, everybody. Madam Chair, board members, and President Williams, thank you for having me on. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Chris Schoonover, and I work at Capital City Consulting. Uh, we're, a, we're a lobbying firm, as mentioned, uh, based up here in Tallahassee, and we also have a Tampa office as well that's managed by my partner, Justin Day, so not too far from y'all. Um, I've been with the firm 10 years and have quite a bit of experience in the higher education realm. I'm, I'm a former student body president at FSU, so it, uh, it's, it, it goes, it's near and dear to my heart when it comes to education issues. So as you talked about, um, someone, I guess gonna go to the next slide. We'll just go right on through it. Um, yes, today is organizational session here in Tallahassee. This is what the, after the election, two weeks after it, uh, the legislature formally organizes yesterday. Um, uh, Chris Sprouse um, was officially chosen as speaker of the Florida House for the next two years. And then Wilton Simpson of Pasco County was chosen as Senate president for the next two years. Uh, both chambers will meet today to officially um, organize and, uh, and get ready to do work. And as you can see in front of you, they've released the dates for the interim committee weeks. Um, and there will be five committee weeks starting in January. Uh, typically there is a committee week in December, but due to COVID, They've decided to hold off on that. They're just trying to limit exposure to everybody, especially with the holidays. Um, you know, everyone with Thanksgiving and coming back to Tallahassee to meet, they felt like in the safety of everybody. That it was best just to cancel the December committee weeks they, they typically have, which is why there's five before session starts on March 2nd. So it will be a very, very busy interim committee week um, schedule this, this for the 2021 session. Um, so essentially you can look at it, it won't just be a 60 day legislative session, it's gonna be um, a lot more than that. I've, I've joked and I said those committee weeks essentially make session um, 120 days. Um, let me go to the next slide. So here's what we look at on what's been, excuse me? Guess what? Okay, I thought it must've been a reverberation. Um, Senate leadership, as I mentioned, Wilton Simpson is the, is the Senate president. Um, Aaron Bean, Senator Aaron Bean from Fernandina Beach is gonna be president pro tempore. Um, Senator Bean has been in the Senate for, for, this is his last two years, so he's been at for six years, right? and this will be his last term. Um, Senate president designate will be Kathleen Pasadomo from Naples, Florida, and she is also gonna be rules chair. And then the minority leader will be Gary Farmer um, from Broward County. They have not released yet um, the, the chairs of all the substantive committees yet. Um, we're still waiting on that. It's, it's very likely from what we know is that Senator Stargell of Polk County will be the appropriations chair. Um, and that's pretty much all we know at this point, but usually they announce those chairs in both the House and Senate once organizational session happens. It may come out today, but it may not come out for a couple of weeks as they continue to kind of formally organize all that. And then next we'll go to the House So uh, Speaker Sprouse released quite a bit more than the Senate has on his leadership team, as you can see in front of you. Um, and we don't need to run through all these, but of, of typical interest to y'all, as you can see, Brian Avila from Miami will be Speaker Pro Tempore. Um, Brian has is a, is a, been in the legislature now for six years. This is his final term. Majority leader will be Mike Grant um, from Southwest Florida. And then the minority leaders, which is very unique for this session, there's co-minority leaders. 
So you have Evan Jenny and Bobby DuBose. Um, they reached an agreement with their class members to be, be co-leaders instead of fighting each other to be one. They reached an agreement last year just to share the, the title and you know they're gonna uh, work it out. One person's gonna be more policy oriented and the other's gonna be uh, handle whipping the votes during session. Um, the appropriations chair will be um, Representative Jay Trumbull uh, from Panama City Beach in Panama City. Um, so he, he will oversee the entire appropriations process. And then um, good for y'all is your, the, the education policy chair is gonna be Chris Lotbala, um, someone that is very familiar with St. Pete College, knows y'all very well. Um, so it's, it's good to have him in that position as we work through some policy changes as these next two years um, for the next two sessions. Um, we can go to the next slide. All right. So what to expect this upcoming session? The House has released some changes to the rules. And there's two set, there's one part of that that impacts kind of where we go for upcoming session and project bills. So appropriation projects bills are required for projects um, for colleges, for example, on um, what you want to pursue. And Something that's changed in the past is the appropriations bills were filed as regular bills and they had to be passed out of their first committee of reference to be included in the House budget. It took up a lot of time in committee. Sometimes there were over 100 bills on these committees and no one ever asked questions. So the, the speaker has proposed to change the rules. Number one, they will be heard on a consent agenda as a block. So you won't you won't have to go through the you know each bill by itself. Um, a member will be able to um, log a no vote after the fact if they don't agree with the bill on the consent agenda. Um, moving on from that, there are this is where things get a little bit, uh, quite a bit different, is an organization that submits a form for a appropriation project will be required to submit uh, attestation, verifying that it's that information in that project is accurate and true. And if something in, is found to be um, not accurate or false, you can be held um, in contempt and be um, called by the Florida House representatives to um, to testify before committee um, to defend you know why why that information in your form wasn't wasn't accurate as you said it was so uh, they're trying to hold organizations accountable so they're not inflating their numbers um, and keeping these things realistic moving on the next big change is that to get funded in the house budget you, there has to be funding of 50% or more of what your ask was. So if you ask for $4 million, but the chair of the appropriation subcommittee can only give you a million dollars, you're very likely not going to be included in the house budget because it, very, it, it will go against the house rules. So the idea here is they're trying to rein in the asks um, from entities um, that require state money. So Instead of inflating your ass, they're saying ask modestly, knowing that we are going to be under some budget constraints next year. So ask with what you need, knowing that you know we're only going to put it in if we get 50% or more of what you request. And then finally, you always hear in the past, you know, what is the local match? You all, you know, asks you all have had have had kind of a, a local match for previous asks you all have made. Committee staff is going to verify those local commitments to verify they are accurate and true. Up to this point. People put in their forms kind of, yes, we'll put this amount of money in, but after it was funded by the state, a lot of times the money wasn't able to be spent because the local match um, was inaccurate or never came through. So that that's a very big change as we move forward to the appropriations process and the House of Representatives. Uh, the Senate has, they released the rules. They are not changing their appropriations process. Um, there, there's, just so you're aware, it, it, it's not a bill that's filed, it's just a form that's filed in the Senate, in the Senate website. Um, and it's just, it's filed there for transparency purposes, but it is never, it, isn't, it will not be a bill, and which is the way it's been in the past. And then just a couple, couple of just small things to change. Um, the House is increasing the bill limits to seven for each member. So each member gets one additional bill slot, and then they're gonna reduce the amount of um, proposed committee bills. You won't see that in the House very much, so there won't, it's very unlikely to be a really big committee package that comes out as a, as a committee. I'm gonna let folks meet till week six, which is, a, which is a big change considering session's only nine weeks long. So they'll be able to meet a lot longer into session, those subcommittees. So bills before, you know, you're, you're paying attention to them saying, ah, they're not gonna get out because subcommittees. And there's not a lot more time. So you're gonna see a lot, uh, a lot more bills move through the process um, with the chance to get to the floor for full consideration. And then they're making some changes to allow um, 
additional amendments to be filed in committee as long as they're just if they're germane to the relating to clause, which is um, used to be a lot more narrow. Now they're, they're expanding a little bit to allow members to flush some stuff out in committees. Next slide. Um, so COVID, I mentioned before the COVID-19 impacts. And uh, so as of right now, as we sit here, the Capitol complex is closed to the public. The only f people that are allowed in the Capitol right now for organizational session are members and, and one guest of their choosing. Um, there are usually they invite back former members. They weren't invited back. Um, only a few guests were invited back. So they're keeping it very, very closed right now. Um, as folks, as they try to navigate the waters to figure out how best to keep members safe, who are coming from all parts of this, of the state, and then have to go home to their families and, and their communities. Right? So you're, they're trying to be as careful as possible. Uh, they have not released the protocols yet for session yet. Um, uh, I can only speak on speculation that, you know, they will open the Capitol to, to visitors and members of the public for session, but there will be probably restrictions put in place. There is some rumors that they may require rapid testing of all visitors who enter the Capitol, where you have to kind of go, go get rapid tested. You'll go stand off to the side somewhere and wait to find out if you're positive or not. Um, additionally, there is likely going to be some restrictions on lab, large gatherings, days at the Capitol. So your typical um, fly-ins won't, won't be authorized. And then additionally to enter the Capitol, you have to show that you actually have a meeting with a, a representative or a Senator um, to enter the Capitol. Um, a lot of members are gonna likely just do Zoom meetings with, with constituents and, and members of the public um, to protect them and their staffs um, for the same reason they are right now. And then the last thing was, is, is they're likely gonna limit capacity to committee rooms, 20%, um, that's what I'm hearing. So. There will be a, you know, if you need to get in there to testify, the House and Senate are likely to set up um, a ways to do it virtually. So you'll get a login link, you'll register ahead of time that I want to testify on a certain bill, you'll get a link to do it and there will be a, a, a queue put online for when it's, the bill comes up, kind of like we're doing right now. Um, moving to the fiscal impacts of COVID-19, this is, this, is, this is probably the most substantive and most important thing of our discussion today is the fiscal year 19, ended down $1.9 billion. Now we had reserves in place to cover that loss um, from last fiscal year um, and, and it, it wasn't much of a, an impact at all. But looking forward, the Legislative Office of Economic um, and Demographic Research in August presented to the Legislative Budget Commission their long range fiscal outpick, impact. Um, but what's, what does it look like moving forward regarding COVID-19? For fiscal year 2021, they estimate that we are going to be down $3.4 billion based on the way they passed the budget last session. So that's 3.4 for this fiscal year we're in right now that they're estimating we're going to come in under our original estimates. And then in 21, 22, 2 billion, and then it's just way down the road, they're estimating 22, 23, a billion. So that's quite the big impact that the legislature is going to have to deal with this upcoming session. Um, we're hearing you know, it's very likely they're going to make some budget cuts between three and $5 billion in, in the total budget number this next session. So they're going to look for places to cut um, and they're going to have to do it in general revenue mainly. And that's going to make them make some very hard decisions. Uh, they're not going to be able to send as much money home to their local districts. Um, but that is the reality they're facing. Now, as you see in the next two bullet points, things can change, right? So we're sitting there, the state is sitting right now on a little, if almost $6 billion in CARES Act money. And we all read the press, there may be another CARES Act package at some point um, that could increase that amount as well. That money is sitting there because there are some restrictions put in place as we sit by the federal government on how that money can be used. States are negotiating with um, the Trump administration to allow that money to be used to deal with budget deficits due to COVID, just not on COVID response, like PPE equipment and testing materials. So they're trying to release the restrictions on that. If that's released, then that's a lot of money that will be made available to make up that $3.4 billion loss we're facing this fiscal year. So the what I mean by saying that is depending on where things go, I can't say now, the budget cuts may not be as significant as they kind of, as we inspect them as we sit here today. So a lot, there's a lot unknown. Um, and a lot can change when we get to January and February. So with that being said, you know, President Williams and, and Aaron and I, we've talked and, you know, we'll come back in, a, in next month and we can talk a little bit more about our strategic plans for next session. 
because at this point it's just too soon to, to narrow it down so we don't know what we're looking at yet um, regarding kind of the fiscal impacts um, but we should have more information on that as we get through winter and into spring and get closer to the start of session uh, next slide please and that's it i thought that was the last one so there's my information if any of you all have any questions uh feel free to reach out that's my cell phone I'm always available 24 seven. Um, and if you have, you know, whether it's this or political question, um, don't be shy, feel free to call me whenever. So thank you and I'll happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, any questions, comments, desires? Thanks, Cooney. I just want to thank, thank you. Chris um, for his work, uh, Nick and team, Eric. Um, we have been Johnny on the spot and they have been very responsive to our requests and questions. So we're very glad to partner and thank you to the foundation uh, for their support. Uh, we would not be able to work with Capital City um, without them. And so I'm very proud of the work and, and the presentation that's been done and our strategy going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your faith and trust in us. Thank you so much. All right, have a great day, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, moving on to our consent agenda. Um, we had no old business, new business. There was a personnel report in your packet. Um, the renovation of Epitech GMP contract. Variety of other bids, contracts, any comments, questions? Can, can I ask a, a quick question before we vote? Sure. Um, on the approval of the GMP uh, for EPI, w can someone remind me, is that in range with what we were uh, estimating it to be? I couldn't find the last numbers we discussed. So what we had approximated for EpiTech was um, a range of about $600,000. And obviously after we developed the drawings and everything else, the GMP is, is under that amount. There are a couple of te technology items that we included within the overall project budget, which our own internal staff is gonna, is gonna go ahead and implement. So anytime that you're moving a large group of people from one area to the next, you have an additional network switches and everything else right. that are needed in order to accommodate them. Thank you. So yeah, that's guaranteed maximum, yep. what you're seeing there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, is there a motion to accept? I move that we accept uh, the consent <coughs> agenda as a whole. Any other comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Thank you. Informational reports. We have Leaper Ratner, and thank you, Mr. Kidwell, for that. Um, Institute for Strategic Policy and Solutions and the Foundation. Uh, Palladium, which has back open for limited business, so we're glad to see that. And. Um, also, our operating budget report, I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to that because the team has done such an amazing job, especially with our uh, tuition estimates. And if you look at our hours and our finances, if you had told me in August this is what we'd be looking at, there would be uh, no chance I would have believed you. So. Um, we are, thank you all from the recruitment, from the faculty and staff who is really holding the hands of our students to make sure that they can complete their hours online and uh, those that are, are in person, our uh, facilities teams for keeping everybody feeling safe and um, it's really a testament to everyone that uh, I know Dr. Williams and I talk regularly about the how some of the other colleges in Florida are faring in light of the technology changes in COVID. And so it, it's really a relief to see this. So thank you all so much. Um, it's about the informational reports. Okay. 
Uh, we have no changes to the rules manual proposed, and so now we have our president's report. Actually, um, Madeline and Chris <laughs> shared sure. what I normally talk about at the end of the meeting. Um, I just want to um, just recognize the staff. Um, everybody is stepping up and filling in the gaps and working double time and double hard, and I just want to recognize them for the work that's being done. Um, and thank you all as board members for your meetings and taking my calls and talking to me on a daily basis on issues. It's been very helpful. As you know, things happen overnight very quickly. Um, and we're now really looking at the strategic plan and how to better align the institution. With COVID, we know that all of the functionalities that we have may not be needed as they were in the past. And as with many major businesses, people are making those changes and those alignments and using technology as a complement to the work, but not just taking over. But there are some more um, strategizing and work we need to do to um, continue to do that. And also to be the college that sets policy and moving things forward and not waiting for things to happen. And that's what I'm the most proud about uh, with this team and our faculty and staff is, is trying not to wait for it to happen to us, but to impact it and be on the, the front lines of that. And so there's some new things coming forward that we're working on to prepare for the new um, higher ed uh, world and what that looks like. Great. So thank you to everybody. And our next meeting date in December at the Epi Center. And um, we do have our foundation uh, meeting for the launch of our campaign with our foundation consultants over lunch today. So we are finishing this meeting a bit early. Um, so please, if I, I know we all might leave to go do some real, some other work and then come back. And so please just, we need to be back here for lunch at 11. Is that, I'm looking here. Yeah. It's at 11 o'clock. Right at 11, okay. Right at the 11, back here in this room then? Or are we gonna be over in the? We're gonna be in the Florida room. In the Florida room. 11 so o'clock. 11 a.m. in mm -hmm. the Florida room. So with that, if there's no other business, I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Hopefully um, it will be uh, filled with uh, good ti tidings and, and thankfulness. So uh, we are adjourned. Enjoy. <laughs>